Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about biogeochemical cycles. Specifically today, we're going to be going over the major biogeochemical cycles, and then I'll talk about chemical reservoirs using the carbon cycle as the major example for today, and then greenhouse gases, photosynthesis and respiration, decomposition or oxidation versus burial, and then we'll talk about carbon isotopes to track carbon burial through time, as well as the difference between carbon isotopes in inorganic versus organic carbon. And to end it today, we'll talk a little bit about the amazing diversity diversity of the tool of carbon isotopes and what they can allow us to determine about Earth's past as well as Earth's future. So that's what we'll be going over today and then next time to do the part two of this video because biogeochemical cycles is a pretty broad topic that can go in a lot of different directions. We're going to be talking about mountain building and weathering as a carbon sink, carbon and sulfur burial and anoxia, and ocean chemistry next time in the part two. And I may even have later parts to these biogeochemical cycle videos because there is so much to talk about and biogeochemical cycles includes a lot of different concepts. So first, let's talk a little bit about the major biogeochemical cycles that are referred to when people say biogeochemical cycles. Wow, I'm saying that word a lot. I apologize. <laughs> anyway, these major cycles include carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen, water, and oxygen because they're important for life, bio, and and they're important for the processes in the geosphere, geo, and they're important chemically, chemical. So I'm not going to be like many other videos that talk about biogeochemical cycles and just recite the different ways that these chemicals can be cycled through the systems of Earth. Instead, I'm going to be talking mainly about the factors that control biogeochemical cycling on Earth. And to do this, I'm going to be talking mainly about the carbon and oxygen cycles. And later in the next video, I'm going to talk a little bit about phosphorus and nitrogen because those are major nutrients that can cause anoxia, which is something we'll talk about next time as well. And then the water cycle is something that throughout talking about these other cycles, we're basically also going to be talking about because the water cycle is a major component of moving all of these other cycles through their cycles. <laughs> And the reason this is, is because water bodies can act as major chemical reservoirs, bringing us to our next slide, chemical reservoirs. What are they? Well, as we see in the example here to the right, we have the carbon cycle shown and they have this label at the top right called carbon stores. All these gray boxes like atmosphere, ocean, surface ocean, deep ocean, rock, soil, vegetation, all of these gray boxes are chemical reservoirs and all of the blue boxes are processes. The chemical reservoirs are basically exactly what they sound like. They're like boxes that hold the chemicals. For example, as we talk about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today, carbon dioxide is the chemical and the atmosphere is the reservoir for that chemical. Additionally, we have the ocean, glaciers, biomass, and rocks and soil that can also act as chemical reservoirs. And as the processes that move around carbon, like respiration, release of carbon dioxide, or photosynthesis, taking up carbon dioxide, can move this carbon around, what is happening through those processes is moving the carbon from reservoir to reservoir. And so now that we understand what the major biogeochemical cycles are and how they move between different chemical reservoirs, I want to talk in this video a lot about the photosynthesis and respiration cycle. But to do so, we first need to talk a little bit about greenhouse gases to understand a little bit about why carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is even important. And then we can move on to the rest of the video. So I have here this animation of the greenhouse gas Effect. There's numbered steps throughout this animation. First, solar radiation reaches Earth's surface, and some of that radiation gets reflected back into space. However, some of that radiation gets absorbed by Earth's surface, and when it's absorbed, it can move through Earth systems, heating the ocean, heating the land, etc. And then it can be re-radiated back into space. And when heat re-radiates back into space from Earth, some of this heat can be re-scattered by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and therefore stay in the atmosphere and continue to heat the earth. This is the greenhouse gas effect. And therefore, when the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increases, the warming of Earth increases. And in this animation, they're showing that as humans increase greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere, the global warming situation continues to compound itself and get worse. However, I want to stress that humans are not the only ones that can change or increase or decrease the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. Throughout Earth's history, greenhouse gases 
oceans have increased and decreased in Earth's atmosphere many, many times, causing many, many different climate change events throughout the geologic record. And today we're going to be talking about a lot of the other major factors that can control greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and their movement throughout different chemical reservoirs and how that affects Earth's climate as a whole. However, to do so, we must talk about the photosynthesis respiration cycle. By understanding the photosynthesis respiration cycle, we can understand a little bit better how carbon and oxygen are recycled through our systems. So in this figure, we can see that photosynthesis and respiration are basically the opposite processes from one another. We know that plants take up carbon dioxide during photosynthesis and release oxygen, and we know that we respire by taking up oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. But to get a little bit more specific here, we can see that what the components of this reaction are, are basically sugars or reduced organic carbon, C6H12O6, on the left, and oxygen, which we take up along with sugars to create energy, and then we release carbon dioxide. And then we have the opposite process in which carbon dioxide and water plus sunlight are used during photosynthesis to create sugars and release oxygen. But something I want to point out here is that plants and all photosynthesizing organisms don't only photosynthesize. They also respire. Yes, plants take up oxygen and release carbon dioxide, at night. And the reason is because the third component of that equation, water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight, is only available during the day. And so when sunlight's not available, plants do respire. They release carbon dioxide. And so now you might be thinking that if plants take up carbon during the day and release it during the night, then why do we think that planting more trees will sequester carbon and store that carbon? You might be thinking that it's futile if they're just going to release all their carbon that they took up during the day at night. Well, this isn't necessarily the case. The net effect of plants and other photosynthesizing organisms is the storage of carbon, because what they do is they create sugars, like we showed in the previous equation, and these sugars go into building their biomass. The biomass is how plants and other photosynthesizing organisms store carbon. And this production of biomass, which is how plants and trees grow, is the way in which they tip the balance in the favor of storing carbon rather than having a net zero effect on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But now the question you might be asking is, well, okay, they store carbon while they're living and growing and they continue to photosynthesize. But then what happens when they die? Bacteria and other decomposers just reoxidize them and the carbon that they stored goes back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Well, yeah, that's true, but not all organic material becomes decomposed and reoxidized and reintroduced into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. The alternative to decomposition is burial. And because burial prevents reduced organic carbon from becoming oxidized and reintroduced in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, this carbon burial acts as a carbon sink and an oxygen source to the atmosphere. Oxygen increases in the atmosphere due to carbon burial because it's not being used to respire and oxidize that organic material. And the carbon is being stored in the rock record for a long period of time. However, decomposition of dead plant material and other organic matter is not the only way in which carbon dioxide is reintroduced in the atmosphere from stored carbon. In fact, humans invented a whole new way to release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And it is way, way faster. Because we are not just using the energy from eating the sugars in trees and plant material and releasing carbon dioxide from just respiring, we are actually reaching down into the earth, grabbing the buried carbon and directly oxidizing all of that carbon and releasing it back into the atmosphere without it having to wait its millions of years and wait its turn for natural processes to bring it back up to Earth's surface. And so because we're expediting the process of oxidizing these buried hydrocarbons or fossil fuels, we're causing a carbon source and an oxygen sink because it's the opposite process of carbon burial. However, I want to switch gears for a second here because to understand and track carbon burial events throughout Earth's history and therefore to understand what we're doing to the atmosphere today necessitates a little bit of understanding of carbon isotopes. Now on this slide, I show some fractionation patterns of carbon isotopes 
through natural systems, through the carbon cycle. However, if you're not really familiar with the basics of carbon isotopes, I suggest you watch my carbon isotope video before we move on in this video. Because here I'm just going to jump right in to how we can use carbon isotopes to track carbon burial throughout Earth's history. Basically, as we see on this slide, we have carbon moving through its chemical reservoirs like the ocean, the atmosphere, and organic material in plants and other organisms. And as it moves through these chemical reservoirs, the processes that occur to move it between different reservoirs are fractionating the carbon isotopes within the compounds that the carbon is incorporated in. An example of this fractionation occurs in photosynthesis. Photosynthesizing organisms take up more carbon-12 or light carbon isotopes than they do heavy carbon-13 isotopes. In doing this, they're fractionating the carbon isotopes. They're incorporating very light carbon isotopes in their organic material, therefore organic carbon that gets buried has very light carbon isotope signature, and they're leaving behind very heavy carbon isotopes to be incorporated into inorganic carbon like calcium carbonate minerals. And so when we have this organic carbon and these inorganic carbon minerals in the rock record, we can measure their isotopes to understand a little bit about the carbon burial rate during the time of their deposition. So for example, when we have very light organic carbon in the rock record compared to relatively very heavy calcium carbonate in the rock record, we know the burial rate of carbon was very high because when the organic material from the plants and photosynthesizing organisms that cause that huge fractionation of carbon isotopes gets buried, that leaves behind only very heavy isotopes for calcium carbonate to incorporate in their minerals. The opposite can be seen in a period of increased oxidation of carbon. So for example, now we're taking a lot of buried carbon and releasing all those light carbon isotopes into the atmosphere, allowing both organic and inorganic carbon to incorporate light and heavy carbon isotopes into their mineral structures. And therefore, the carbon isotope ratios or delta C13 of organic carbon compared to that of calcium carbonate during times of decreased carbon burial rate and increased oxidation of organic carbon are going to be relatively similar or less different, less fractionated from one another because they both have access to the same light and heavy carbon isotopes. An example of a positive carbon isotope excursion that occurred in Earth's history around the early Mesozoic due to increased carbon burial rate is shown in the graph to the left here. During this time, around 249 to 248 million years ago, you had this huge jump in carbon isotopes of inorganic carbon or calcium carbonate, which was caused by an increased carbon burial rate during that time. You can see where the black shales were formed due to organic carbon burial, and this left over only very heavy carbon isotopes for calcium carbonate to incorporate into their mineral structures. But now that we understand a little bit about why carbon isotopes may become more positive in calcium carbonate during these times and vice versa when carbon burial rate is low, the question now becomes what causes carbon burial rate to change in the first place? We know that now we're taking carbon that's buried in the rock record directly from the rock record and releasing it to the atmosphere and therefore slowing the carbon burial rate directly. But throughout Earth's history, this burial rate has changed many times, creating the fossil fuel deposits that we have at our disposal today. So what has caused these changes throughout Earth's history when we weren't around? The short answer is feedback, but this is a complicated answer. And I'm going to explain to you an example of a feedback mechanism right here that is a lot simpler than climate change actually is in real life. So keep in mind as we go through this example of biogeochemical feedback that it is not this simple in real life. So I have this example here showing that increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causing warming might cause increased primary productivity or photosynthesis, and that might cause anoxic water bodies, which we'll talk about in the next video a lot more. But basically, this causes an increased carbon burial rate because a lack of oxygen, anoxic, allows that carbon to be buried without becoming reoxidized first. And this increased carbon burial rate, like we talked about before, causes a sink of carbon and a source of oxygen, so cooling due to carbon dioxide removal and increased oxygen, which might then cause increased respiration and therefore increased decomposition and oxidation of organic material, and therefore increasing carbon dioxide once more, and that causing a return to the warming trend. And so some things I want to highlight in this feedback mechanism include warming causing something that then causes cooling, and then cooling causing something that then causes warming again. These feedback mechanisms are occurring in loops, and they're basically balancing each other out, 
and this is what's called negative feedback. The negative term in negative feedback is just used to refer to the fact that it's kind of a balancing act. The warming causes something that balances out the warming causing cooling, and the cooling causes something that balances out the cooling by causing warming again. And so this balancing effect is negative feedback. However, there are positive feedback mechanisms. I don't have one shown here, but the classic example of a positive feedback mechanism is ice. Ice cover increases surface reflectivity on Earth, and therefore, when there's more ice on Earth, there's more reflectivity of solar radiation and less heating, causing more cooling, which caused the ice cover to increase in the first place. This compounding effect can go both ways. As warming causes melting of ice, melting of ice causes less surface reflectivity, and therefore more solar radiation can be absorbed by the increased land area on Earth. And this increased absorption of radiation causes increased warming, and so ice melting compounds the warming effect. And so this is called a positive feedback, when instead of balancing out the system or the trend that is occurring, it just compounds that effect. And so these feedback mechanisms are really, really important. And I know I'm spending a lot of time on this, but it's super important. And I will have later videos that will talk a lot more about feedback because it can get really complicated. There are a lot of factors that come into this. And we'll talk about a lot more of those factors in the next video as we talk more about feedback in the next video. But for this video, I want to finish up with two major uses of carbon isotopes that I think really point out the diversity of this carbon isotope tool and how we can use it to tell so many different things in science in general. So let's get into these two major uses of carbon isotopes. The first major use I want to point out is the use of carbon isotopes to detect early life on Earth. You might be wondering how the heck does carbon burial rate have anything to do with detecting early life on Earth? Yes, carbon isotopes aren't fossils per se, but they are biochemical signatures that can act as fossils. The carbon burial rate, as we saw earlier, affected the carbon isotope composition of organic carbon and inorganic carbon in the rock record, was caused mainly by photosynthesizing organisms fractionating carbon isotopes and taking up very light isotopes of carbon. This really light isotopic signature of organic carbon in the rock record can be traced all the way back to rocks and the issue of formation of Western Greenland that are 3.9 billion years old. This metasedimentary graphite in this formation has shown carbon isotopic signatures that are light enough to possibly be evidence for early photosynthesizing organisms. But of course, the rock record is unfortunately very incomplete for rocks this old. And that kind of sucks because we can't corroborate this evidence with other formations on Earth, or at least not that we've found yet. So it's important to know that this is really compelling evidence for early life and 3.9 billion years ago is a heck of an early start for photosynthesizing organisms on Earth. But again, it's really hard to prove without other rocks from this period that show similar signs. And it's hard to find those rocks because again, like we've discussed throughout this entire lecture, things on Earth are typically cyclic and the rock cycle is no exception to that. The rock cycle is a cycle and it recycles rock material. And because of this, we have very few rocks that survive this long and retain their geochemical signatures. However, I still think it's pretty cool use of carbon isotopes and one that's worth pointing out, especially because carbon isotopes not only can tell us maybe a little bit about early life on Earth, but can maybe even tell us about the presence of life on other worlds. The last thing I want to discuss is fossil fuels. We talked about carbon isotope signatures being really light in fossil fuels because the material that makes up fossil fuels is organic carbon material that has preferentially taken up carbon-12 or light carbon into its structure. And because we then come and use these fossil fuels and burn them and release the carbon from these fossil fuels into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. We are then releasing all this carbon-12, this light carbon that was stored in these fossil fuels into the atmosphere, which has a very different carbon isotope composition than what we're releasing, because what we're releasing has been heavily fractionated. Additionally, the signature of carbon isotopes in organic material or fossil fuels becomes even more specific and distinct from the background carbon in the atmosphere because because what we're releasing has not only a distinct carbon-13-12 ratio, but also has distinct carbon-14 concentrations. Carbon-14 is not a stable isotope of carbon, it's actually a radioactive isotope of carbon. Because it's radioactive, it decays over time into nitrogen-14. And because the organic carbon in these fossil fuels is so old, it really has negligible carbon-14 left. And this lack of carbon-14 and abundance of carbon-12 in the fossil fuels that we then burn and release into the atmosphere create 
creates a very unique signature of what we're releasing into the atmosphere. And therefore, we can tell pretty much exactly how much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today is due to us burning fossil fuels rather than natural processes. So I think that's a pretty significant tool to have as we move forward in trying to combat climate change. So I hope this video was helpful and you learned a little bit about the major biogeochemical cycles, how these chemicals move between chemical reservoirs, greenhouse gases, and how they can cause the greenhouse effect, photosynthesis and respiration, and how they balance each other out and become out of balance and can cause carbon burial events, and how they can also be decomposed and reoxidized, and how we can track these different burial and oxidation events throughout our history using carbon isotopes, as well as using carbon isotopes to do a lot of other things like study climate change or even early life on Earth or life on other planets. And I hope that you are excited to learn next time about weathering as a carbon sink, carbon and sulfur burial, and my personal favorite thing to talk about, anoxia, in which we're going to talk a little bit more about feedback mechanisms and ocean chemistry, which is another personal favorite of mine. So I hope you're excited about that part two video. And if you watch both of these parts and you think there's something else that I should go over in terms of biogeochemical cycles, I'm all ears because this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. So please let me know in the comments and I'll be happy to make more videos about this in the future. With that, I'm going to thank you guys again for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.